Can you prepare for surprises? Sounds paradoxical, doesn't it? I'm Ray Myers, and welcome to Craft vs. Croft. I, as usual, do not represent my employer, but I am currently working on the Chaos team at Indeed. And I, uh, I gotta say, a year ago, I would have probably told you I understood reliability pretty well. I had implemented core release processes at uh, four different companies. I had, uh, you know, made lots of improvements like reducing alert fatigue so people could sleep at night, uh, drastically in some cases increasing the, you know, availability of the system or our confidence in being able to, to push changes out safely, uh, in some cases reducing uh, release cadences from things like every six weeks to every two weeks uh, or from every two weeks to a daily basis. I uh, cer certainly still have lots of reliability gurus who I look up to, but I had some notches on my belt. I thought I got it. And uh, recently I've learned about some, some concepts that answer, um, or at least provide a direction to answer, a lot of nebulous concepts that uh, would still uh, would still come up and were really uh, difficult to get a handle on, paradoxes. And so that's why I'd like to, to share with you uh, a bit about resilience engineering. So it's a bit of a deep concept to answer what resilience really is. And I'm going to give you an introduction to that. Uh, words sometimes have multiple meanings. When we talk about resilience engineering, which is a, an active field of, of academic study, this is going to give you an introduction to what the implications of that are. Over the past several decades, there's been a rethink of how we need to approach safety. As uh, systems have gone more complex and safer with more protective layers, thus making them even more complex. We have reached a plateau in how much we can improve them using traditional failure analysis, using what's often called in the literature, the old way. And new models have been developed using uh, lots of experience across a lot of different industries where similar conclusions have been reached that uh, help us, you know, in some cases replace, in some cases augment our understanding of how sh we should approach safety. This is often called the safety one to safety two shift. So this is characterized, though it's pretty subtle, uh, in all its detail, from a, a shift in thinking from people as the problem to people as the solution, people as the source of safety, rather than just the source of the deviations from procedure that cause the safety violations, right? So we're going from minimizing how things go wrong to maximizing how they go right. Now, in a way, that's talking about exactly the same thing, but consider that when you only model safety as the absence of accidents, you're saying that safety is a concept that only exists in the negative. You, uh, you're not actually saying anything about what promotes it. So this shift in thinking uh, from defining safety negatively to defining it as the positive outcome allows us to go from being reactive to proactive. And you're going to see a lot in this about the difference in how we think of human error. Human error was formally thought to be the end result of the investigation if you found the human error. But now we understand that human error is just an attribution, right? Uh, humans improvise. Humans do unexpected things all the time and often it's beautiful that's just as likely to be the source of a safer outcome than a less safe outcome um, and typically what people do at any given moment they have every reason to believe is a reasonable course of action uh, we're only attributing it as an error later so in a safety two investigation we see something that looks like a human error and that is actually the beginning of our investigation we now need to discover what made that seem reasonable in the context this is related to the difference in emphasis on work as planned versus work as done if you're only looking at accidents in your investigation and you don't look at work on a normal day 
uh, you will see in the timeline someone deviating from some procedure and think, ah, there is the problem. But if you actually study work as done on a day-to-day -day during non-events, you're going to discover people improvise around the plans all the time, right? These, uh, these policies, these procedures, uh, people go around them often because they just don't work. They're not relevant. They're, they're, uh, the plans themselves need to be updated. So we do need both work as planned and work as done, but they need to inform each other. It's not a one-way relationship. So I'm not going to do too many examples today, but I wanted to at least give you a couple. So let's uh, look at an early one. This is the B-17 bomber. Now you see these two switches that are highlighted here. One of those controls the landing gear. Another one controls the wing flap. They are also almost identical and right next to each other. Now, if you were to press the wrong one, very possible the plane's going to crash. And in a time of stress, I think you'd agree that that's um, very easy to do by accident. Now, at the time this was created, that sort of issue would only be attributable to pilot error. That's the only way they had to understand this, actually. And uh, they would have no real action they could do other than, well, we've got to train the pilots better. But that didn't work. But after shockingly 400 crashes of a similar nature, uh, it was eventually understood that, you know, if pilot error were the problem, then the errors would just be random. They wouldn't all be of this particular type. And there was an aviation psychologist that uh, highlighted what we just saw on the last slide, that uh, you've got these, these two things that are dangerously similar. Now, this was the first time uh, they introduced the term designer error to explain what had gone wrong here instead of pilot error. And he introduced shape coding, which they use still in cockpits to this day to differentiate controls, make sure they don't look like each other. He later helped invent the field of ergonomics and inspired the Macintosh with that. Now this notion of designer error, I wouldn't call fully the leap to safety too, right? Because they're still attributing the error to some individual person, but at least there's a broader level of thinking about where that cause might be. So I think this was a huge step forward. You also have the Swiss cheese model as a, as a transitional understanding. So this, uh, this teaches us that failures are the joining of a bunch of different factors, none of which would um, by themselves cause a loss, right? So imagine I'm standing on the right-hand side of this and someone's trying to shoot me with a little laser beam. Where the holes all lined up, they were able to zap me. But in all the other places, uh, it was blocked by one slice or, or the other. Um, which of these slices is the root cause? Right? As you can see, not, none of them are the root cause. So a safety two investigator would see a contributing factor and not leap to the conclusion that uh, that's where we need to be pointing the finger. We need to look at how they're, how they're in, in combination. So in some ways, this is a very helpful model. On the other hand, it is still very Newtonian. It is seeing a linear chain of, of cause and effect and Really, causality is still more uh, complex than that. It's really a, a network of uh, cause and effect relationships that kind of reverberate against each other in interesting ways. So the Swiss cheese model doesn't get us all the way um, to understanding how uh, complex systems fail, but it, it definitely was a helpful paradigm shift in, in breaking us away from blaming any individual slice of cheese. This is related to the notion of no root cause, which you can see a lot more about in my video called No Root Cause. But um, very briefly, it's, it's kind of like the Swiss cheese thing, right? Uh, and we can go over an example that you may remember. In October 4th, 2021, Facebook was down for, I think, a better part of a day. And for the number one website in the world to be down for that long is, um, very unusual in this day and age. It was uh, international news. And there was this quote from the same day um, outage 
notes that they posted where they say, we want to make clear that we believe the root cause of this outage was a faulty configuration change in their DNS, right? In their domain name uh, configuration. So here we have uh, a, a response to that, right? And so this the lesson here is if you call something a root cause, Lauren Hochstein might totally rip on you on Twitter. So if nothing else, don't do it for that reason. But, um, you know, that's a nice hypothesis Facebook had there. Uh, let's see what they thought one day later, right? Once they'd had even the slightest amount of time to look at what was going on. Well, on October 5th, the next day, they publish a, a more detailed report, and it's actually a very good report. I recommend you go check it out in, in detail. Great read. Uh, just, just some highlights of the factors that were involved here. The first one does cover, yes, um, there was a faulty configuration change. A command was issued intending to assess the availability of a backbone capacity, and it accidentally took down all the connections in the network. Now, then there was a protective layer that was supposed to prevent things like this, uh, an auditing system, but there was a bug in the audit tool, and so it, it didn't stop the command. Okay, further amplifying this, there was uh, something to do with uh, BGP advertisements, which uh, I don't have the networking background to tell you um, how that would have worked, but something was, was broadcasting in a way that was interpreted as being unavailable, even though it was still operational. But maybe the most interesting factor to me here uh, that uh, didn't cause the issue but caused it lasting for so long was that the lack of the DNS resolution at the top level of Facebook.com broke a lot of their internal tools, right, that they would be using to investigate this, to resolve this. They couldn't talk to each other in the normal way. They were probably looking up each other's phone numbers. It's a little unclear from the, from the report, but uh, in the news it was reported that they were unable even to use their security cards to get into the building normally or get into the server room because the key card system also relied on that same facebook.com domain name. There's a whole lot going on here, and I'm glad they released these details because who knows how many other companies would uh, have a lot of trouble resolving an issue just due to their internal tools relying on the same domain name as the their public website. The first two of these I also think would be cause for their own root cause analysis in and of themselves. Like uh, there was a bug in the command. Okay, well, uh, if you look at my video preventing the worst bugs, you can see uh, that uh, bugs are also something that you can prevent if uh, a system is so confusing to code in that the simplest way to complete a task introduces a bug, then that's something that there are ways of addressing. But actually my biggest eyebrow raise is on this, this first point here, because why would a command to uh, assess the availability of something be even possible to confuse with a command that makes a bunch of changes and takes things down? like? I question the ergonomics of a, a tool that makes it possible to accidentally do one when you mean to do something so so innocuous, does a write operation when you, you meant to do a read operation. Presumably they, they looked at why that occurred in their, in their internal investigation, but this is a really solid um, analysis for just a day later. I, I think it's actually really great. And you'll notice if you read the article, nowhere in it contains the words root cause which they had said the previous day. So don't make me tap the sign. So we're seeing now that safety in complex systems is an emergent property. It's not due to a faulty component. It's the way that the components are working together. So to understand that and how to improve it, we need to understand the system. Let's talk about the system because it is maybe not the system that you think it is. Dr. Richard Cook summed this up uh, as relatable to our field very nicely in above the line, below the line. When you talk about the system, you probably have an architecture diagram that would look something like this. It has uh, you know, some database tables, it has some application servers, and so on and so forth, and it's delivering results to the, the user at the bottom through some load balancers, whatever you got. And I want to ask you this. Have you ever seen a database table? 
I've never actually looked at one. I've looked at the contents of one. Um, if you have a message queue, have you ever seen the message queue? Nobody has seen a message queue. Nobody has seen a database table, but we believe that this is what's there, even though we've never seen it. And the reason we can have that belief is we, we interact with these things through representations, right? Through tools. Um, if it's a database table, we've used, uh, you know, a SQL client to see the contents maybe and, and, and so on, right? We have all these different representations that are the only things we can use to view parts of the system and interact with them and, and develop our beliefs about what's actually in them. So maybe what's in your diagram plus the representations are the system. Well, again, not quite because we are part of the system, right? We are a very important part of it. We all have, as you can see on the top, these incomplete and somewhat outdated mental models that we're going off of as we decide what to do. And when things unexpected happen, you know, we interact with the representations, we interact with each other, using and changing our mental models to try and uh, try and adapt, try and fix what's wrong. And there are all these different actions that we're performing here that are very important. Now I do recommend, and I've linked the full article on this, the takeaway right now is the system includes us, right? We are the part that is above the line. The technological part of the system is below the line. And what's below the line, we will never see. We just have our incomplete mental models and we all have different ones. And we have these representations we can interact with and we have each other. Now, it can sound when I say that you're part of a system, like I mean that you're a cog in a machine. And that's not what this means at all, but it does mean if the system treats you like a cog, it is a bad system because human judgment is what brings unique value in a joint cognitive system, or you could say a socio-technical system. With all that, we are now ready to say what resilience truly is. We have two properties that both contribute to reliability. Robustness is what we're calling reacting gracefully to known unusual events, things we've seen before. It is being prepared, in essence, for the past. Resilience is reacting gracefully to unknown events. It's the ability to adapt, sustained over a long period of time. Resilience is being prepared for surprise. Now, robustness is something you can implement and improve by messing around below the line, installing more protective layers, configuring your rules, your procedures, all the mechanics that the machines will use to respond to these events you've seen. Resilience basically just lives above the line with us. It is what we bring to the system. So what do you do with that? Well, I'll go more into that in a future video maybe. I hope I sparked your, your curiosity on it and that you'll uh, learn more from the, the resources that I link in others or maybe just ponder it. But uh, some of the things that come out of this are that if you want to improve the part of resilience and not just robustness, then you need to look above the line. You need to look at the people. How are the people doing? Are they well rested? Are they working well together, both within the team and across teams? Are they, are they well informed? Are there, you know, uh, maybe knowledge silos that need to be addressed? Is their judgment elevated? Are you elevating the human judgment of the people close to the action or only broadcasting directives from above? And as we saw in the safety two paradigm, are we not only trying to minimize the things that go wrong, but are we trying to focus on promoting things going well? And the good news about that is I'm not just saying, you know, 
if you invest in those things, you get some resilience, which might contribute to some additional reliability, right? But these are actually desirable properties for a lot of other reasons too. I might expand on that in a future video. So there are a lot of practices that you could say promote resilience, uh, two of the very concrete ones that have been introduced at Indeed in the last few years are learning from incidents and chaos engineering, which is currently what I'm focusing on. So if you wanna get more into this, and I think you should, these are some sources that, that I found particularly useful, but the first one is Lauren Hochstein, No Root Cause on Twitter, has a whole uh, reading list up on GitHub. So you find all these links in the description. I wish you a resilient life with mostly pleasant surprises and swift adaptation to the unpleasant ones. And remember what Lao Tzu said in the Tao Te Ching, with patience, the most tangled cord may be undone. Thank you.